the truth about gender affirming care. Let's find out. I recently added some stuff on this to the research document. If I told you that I advocate for the- First of all, you can't tell me because you're in a PragerU video, but moving on. Chemical castration, sterilization, and physical mutilation of children and young adults, anyone under the legal age of consent, my guess is that you would consider me a crazy person. Chemical castration and sterilization aside, physical mutilation of children and young adults. I like how children and young adults are being put next to each other here, as if like somebody who's under the age of consent and somebody who's like 20 years old are in a comparable category when it comes to the stupid fear-mongering bullshit we're doing here. Physical mutilation involves literally any kind of surgery, though. So, you know, you sometimes that happens to babies. You know, babies sometimes have surgeries. Sounds kind of scary, but I'm, you know, pretty sure sometimes they need it. Anyone under the legal age or worse. But that's exactly what activists, medical professionals, and progressives who promote and defend gender-affirming care do advocate. I imagine that back when, like, new surgeries were being invented. Imagine like the first time heart surgery became a thing. The idea of doing a heart surgery, like just any surgery on a heart. I don't know what that would have been. I don't know if it's a modern or not modern thing. I feel like before germ theory, we probably wouldn't have survived heart surgery. And people are like screaming, you want to mutilate, you want to, you want to, you want to tear past the inner humors of our God-given bodies, and you want to m molest the sacred core at the heart of our being for people as young as young. That's what supporters of, <laughs> of heart surgery are. Like, you could do this with anything. All right, let's go. The problem for these gender ideologues, of course, is while it is possible to identify as anything, it is not possible for a man to be a woman or a woman to be a man. Damn. Well, that would be the case unless the concept we're talking about is one of identity, in which case um, actually identifying as something makes you that thing, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's actually quite simple. There are lots of categories that we belong to that have nothing to do with some kind of deterministic empirical quota or trait. I mean, hell, being a goth, right? Um, you know, it's, we know that a person can be a goth or not be a goth. Uh, I don't know where exactly you'd find the fine line between the two, but being cool. I'm cool. Many people have said this. Find me the DNA <laughs> strand that makes me this. Um, it's dumb. Uh, you know, there's not actually a point in addressing these arguments because conservatives have been willfully pretending there isn't a difference between gender and sex for like six years now. Like, no matter how many times it gets brought up to them in debates or in direct confrontations, they will always pretend, like they won't even defeat the idea, they won't even address it, they will just pretend that trans activists and progressive people have one concept, which is gender slash sex, as opposed to two separate ones. Um, if they're not going to engage with the arguments, there's no point in me doing it either. We've done this a billion times. To obscure this fact, activists have manufactured a small dictionary of sweet-sounding terms like transgender. <laughs> what? Wait. But conservatives use that term as what? 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 M manufacture. So first of all, all terms are manufactured. We don't discover words. We make them. We make words to describe things, and the thing we're describing here is something that conservatives also describe using the same terminology. Gender fluidity and non-binary. Gender, Gender fluidity always comes up like um, when, when conservatives are just kind of like running through the few terms they've cobbled together in their fearmonger quest. I have never met a person who like actively identified as gender fluid. I, I, I don't even, it's, it, it's just such a, it's such a thing that you just don't interact with unless you're already in communities that have people like that, like really progressive, you know, like more online queer people, or if you're deliberately seeking it out. Affirming care is the phrase activists have coined to describe sex change treatments such as puberty blockers, hormonal injections, and double mastectomies. Um... Okay. Puberty blockers are not sex change treatments at all. They don't do that. That's not a thing they can do. The thing they do is in the name of the medicine. 
puberty blockers. Hormone injections don't necessarily change your sex, um, but they do cause you to adopt different sexual characteristics. It's complicated. We'll probably get to that in a later portion of this video. And double mastectomies are when you take away the, the boobies. Um, and cisgender women have done that before for cancer. It's not necessarily a sex change treatment, you know? Shockingly, children's hospitals are big players in this game. The Boston Children's Hospital's website has posted videos in which its doctors describe a full menu of medical treatments, including hysterectomies for gender-confused teens. The gender clinic... Uh, so, a doctor talked about medical procedures? Okay. Sure. All right. That seems fine. You know, even if... Even even if like uh, uh, a kid was really young or whatever, and they weren't on the table for something like a hysterectomy, you would still mention that down the line, right? Like you might say to someone who's, I don't know, 14, here's stuff we can do now. Down the line, there might be different procedures. This is like totally normal in medicine. Like, yeah. Oh yeah, this is the children's hospital that received bomb threats after... Um, uh, Kaya Rachik, the libs of TikTok woman, and Matt Walsh lied about uh, lied about them. They received bomb threats, had to shut down for a while, and then you know, naturally after that, Matt Walsh basically like celebrated their victory. At the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital in Maine, offers instructions to boys on how to tuck their boy parts to make them look more like girl parts. Yeah, so um, that is something that you can do. Uh, you, you basically, you do a little twisteroo with your dick. I, I've heard that there's a trick to it. I don't know and I don't care. I like having a bulge. I like how this is something that we're fear-mongering over. We're literally talking about, like, here's here's how to, like, move you. Like, I'm pretty sure that if you go to a doctor and you, you like, have a urology appointment or something, you can have the most basic weird shit explained to you by a doctor because the human body is weird and complicated. You know, if you, if you have like if you get an injury on your dick or something like you like, you know, it, it, it gets into like a wood chipper and then the doctor is talking to you and they're like, OK, so here's how you can pee safely without reopening the 17 like uh, gaping wounds that we've sewn together from your, you know, shattered genitalia. Um, I feel like a conservative video would then go like, um, and at this hospital, doctors teach boys how to use their penis or some, some shit like that. You know what I mean? Like so much of these videos are just, how do we take incredibly innocuous concepts and make them sound terrifying? What is this? How does this even sound terrifying as it's being presented? How to tuck your boy parts to make them, it's how to not have a dick bulge. Okay. What, who's dying from this? Yale University's pediatric gender program director has said she's medically assisted children as young as three years old on their gender journey. Okay. Like, with what? Consultation? With, with what? We're not going to say, are we? Because we want to imply that, like, a three-year-old came in and got bottom surgery or something. That's what the video wants to imply. Like, the because the, in the mind of a conservative, what they think is happening here is that a three-year-old boy, like, accidentally got into his mom's drawer and, like, smeared some lipstick across his forehead. And she rushed him over here and immediately, bone, you know, uh, bone saw over here, took at his uh, junk and gave him bottom surgery, which I imagine in the conservative mind is kind of like a wedge cut on wood for a carpenter, where you just do, like, two, like that, you know? Um, but we're not going to say what was done here. Vanderbilt University Medical Center has assessed gender care to be a new profit center. One of its doctors explained... That is true. In, uh, in a for-profit private healthcare system, something Republicans have been ardently fighting for, uh, it is true that medical procedures cost money and make other people profits. I agree that they should be free. I think that you should be able to go to your doctor, get advice on tucking for free. That's that's my position. I stand with PragerU in calling for the decommodification of tucking advice from doctors. 
explained why. Attempting to change someone's sex creates a permanent patient. Knowing patients will have to return for repeated- I like how they gave the trans woman um, uh, a five o'clock shadow there. ...treatments is a guaranteed moneymaker. So, uh, first of all, the same thing could be said of insulin. There are tons of medical procedures that you can get that require long-term medical care afterwards. Like, yeah, we're supposed to go to the doctor anyway. Also, I don't know if you guys know this, but the only long-term care that you, like, probably definitely need as a trans person is continued access to hormones. Hormones aren't that expensive. I mean, their price gets inflated massively because of our for-profit private healthcare system, but it's hardly like a monstrously profitable center of, of exploitation. It's medicine that trans people want. It's not that difficult to make or produce. Cisgender people have been able to get access to estrogen or testosterone for a variety of medical reasons for ages. Um, casually getting testosterone or estrogen to address a number of hormonal abnormalities in cis people, that's been a part of medicine for decades and decades and decades. I, li I like how, again, we're basically making an argument against the concept of medicine that the problem with the treatment is that you might have future treatments, you know? Like, oh, okay. Even the American Academy of Pediatrics has endorsed the medical and chemical treatment of gender-confused children. In what specific sense? Are we going to clarify that exactly? Like, at all? Medical and chemical treatment. Like, chemical and medical... So medical treatment could involve um, uh, consultation. Chemical treatment could involve puberty blockers. Now, I have a crazy point to make to you guys. Uh, puberty blockers don't actually work if you take them after puberty is done. I know, sorry, I, I don't mean to blow your minds or anything. I'm no doctor, but um, as I understand it, you have to take them before the puberty, or at the very least during, not after. Otherwise, there's no point. Gave this kid quite the chin. Yeah, I wonder why. Remember that at the end of the day, transphobia is rooted primarily in disgust over perceived degeneracy. It's the uh, it's the same reason why, like, once you get past all the um, tiresome arguments about why actually we should prevent gay marriage or this, that, the other, at the end of the day, the real argument is they don't like seeing men kissing. And for that reason, at the root of their criticisms, there will always be, like, the attempt to reaffirm disgust as a political principle. So that's why they have to do stuff like this. But it's, that's the actual argument here, you know? When some members asked for a more critical look at affirmative care, they were immediately shut down, accused of being transphobic. Well, that would depend on the way in which they phrased those criticisms, wouldn't it? We're not going to see the specific criticisms here, are we? You're just going to vaguely allude to a thing and then describe it. Hmm. The Pediatrics Academy did not stop there. It teamed up with the American Medical Association and the Children's Hospital Association. Ah, also known as some of the largest and most reputable medical organizations on the planet. Gotcha. The, the AMA, you know, just a small little... Yeah, okay, all right. Oh, go ahead. To petition the Justice Department to suppress anyone on social media who opposes their pro-gender treatment position. Can I get a source on that? Like, please? Kind of difficult to debunk ridiculous claims if I don't even have a... Oh, wow, this has a 50-50 like-dislike ratio. That's interesting. And only 7K likes slash dislikes with nearly a million views. And look at how few likes these comments have. Ah, they, uh, they host this. This video must be hosted on their site. A lot of these views must have come from their site. Or they might have, ooh, ad. It might have been an ad thing. I've heard that if you uh, run a, an existing YouTube video as an ad, the uh, uh, views will get counted towards the uh, um, towards the ad. Man, are they really having to like buy view? Ooh, on the decline, huh? So can I get? Okay, these aren't sources. This is a transcript. For the full script, visit pregu.com. Do you have sources? Stop. If I okay. Do we have so? Learn more about the evils of exploitation and sexualization of children. Speak out. Take the pledge to protect children's innocence. Okay. Facts and sources. Okay. Here we go. Nice. Oh, it's even got like a cute uh, gradient in the background. Okay. 
Oh, wait, th wait, we should check, by the way. Yale University, uh, Young is three years old on their gender journey. Hold on. I want to see. Brags about helping kids as young as three on gender journey if they identify it. With what procedure? The program website at the Yale School of Medicine details how trans surgeries are only available to those 18 and older. Wow. We're not including that one in the script of the of the uh, PragerU video, huh? So they did a consult with somebody three years old, but no surgeries unless you're a legal adult. Ah, uh, okay. Well, you know, ah, uh, well, that seems kind of dishonest considering the deliberate conflation, uh, you know, but eh, uh, whatever. Okay. Powerful pediatrics groups have petitioned the Justice Department to target and suppress the speech of those who oppose their pro-gender treatment agenda. Okay, let's take a look. Here we are on WPDE.com. Pediatric group. Genspec, an org that supports an evidence-based approach to gender distress, has called out the American Academy of Pediatrics for allegedly stifling debate on an internal proposal. What? This is an internal proposal. What does this have to do with censorship on social media? The Pediatrics Academy teamed up with the AMA to petition the Justice Department to suppress... Okay, here we go, here we go. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Health groups demand DOJ target transgender disinformation. Republicans warn against criminalizing civic discourse. Okay. From the Daily Signal. All right. Three national medical organizations sent a letter to the DOJ under Biden urging the department to investigate and prosecute those responsible for an alleged campaign of disinformation about controversial transgender medical interventions, which the organization blamed for an increase in bomb threats to medical... Oh, I remember when this happened. This isn't just about randomly censoring people on social media. This is because there are people who are, uh, 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 you know, uh, front-running representatives of $100 million organizations encouraging stochastic terrorism that leads to the direct threats against doctors and the people they treat. Oh, okay. That seems slightly different from they want the government to ban mean people on social media because, in this case, they're saying the DOJ should investigate crimes. Something the DOJ should be doing. Does it have the letter listed here? Here. The health organization's October 4th letter urged the DOJ to investigate the organization's individuals and entities coordinating, provoking, and carrying out bomb threats and threats of... That's what they're fear-mongering over. Literally, letters saying, Hey, could you look into the bomb threats? DOJ, could you, could you perhaps investigate crimes? And, and, and uh, uh, PragerU is like, they're trying to shut down your Instagram account. Like, okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah, this is what they're looking to do, man. Not going to mention the bomb threats of the video, though. That would, make, that would make them look a little bit evil, if you think about it. It would make them look a bit evil. If, we're, if, we're, if we step back for a moment, and what we're talking about here is hospitals begging the government to keep people from making bomb threats against them. If you think about it, it actually makes the cons look really bad, doesn't it? You know, like kind of like, like, the, like Taliban level evil, you know? All right. Yeah. While the American medical establishment speeds toward the affirmative care cliff, other countries are hitting the brakes. The ah, yes. So what we're about to talk about here is conservative politicians in the UK uh, uh, shutting down trans uh, medical care in the NHS. What they will not be able to provide is a medical justification for doing so. United Kingdom has shuttered its state-run Tavistock Gender Identity Clinic, which was the largest pediatric gender clinic in the world, after a report found that its patients were at considerable risk due to its unquestioning affirmative approach. So we've talked about this before, but the affirmative care model is uh, unquestionably and indisputably the best medical model for dealing with the concerns of trans youth. Uh, there's no medical evidence to suggest otherwise. The reason for that is because an, uh, all the affirmative care approach does is say, whatever you do, don't argue with them about their gender identity. Because why would you do that as a doctor? Like, think for a second. If somebody comes in and they're claiming they feel gender dysphoria and they feel they're trans or like you have a, a, a male at birth, but they, they say they're a woman, okay? No matter what age they are, 
8, 12, 20, 30, 50? What good do you get out of trying to convince them otherwise? Do you think they just came in there on a whim? Like they were getting some groceries and saw the gender clinic bypass the months-long waiting list, sometimes years long, stepped right in and just sort of expressed the thought they'd casually had? No, obviously not. The idea of arguing against it is fruitless. This is the same thing that we had to do with therapists and people who said they were homosexual. See, homosexuality used to be considered a mental disorder, and when people who had homosexual urges would go to therapists or doctors, it wasn't uncommon for those therapists or doctors to say, oh, you're not really gay. Oh, you're not really gay. No, 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 no. This, that, the other, you know, oh, you're not really like that. This was a very ineffective model of healthcare and therapy for a number of reasons. Um, the most obvious of which being they were wrong. Those mother were gay. I have not seen any compelling evidence that the affirmative care approach has put trans youth at any greater risk than any other uh, medical approach. A more accurate description for this approach would be medical malpractice. In no if it could be proven, which it has not been. Whether part of the medical world is it considered acceptable or even legal to damage the body of a healthy person irreversibly? Uh, in all medical practice ever for all of human history. Always. Obviously. By damage the body of a healthy person, what she's actually saying, of course, is perform surgery. And surgery is something that we've been doing for a while. Oh yeah, leaving aside circumcision, that's actually a pretty direct gotcha right there. Literally a completely unnecessary procedure done forcefully to infants about their genitals for no reason. Uh, well, sometimes there's a reason, but very rarely. For the most part, it's considered cosmetic. Uh, also, we have cosmetic surgeries. Speaking of, thank you, Fallen. Cosmetic surgeries uh, don't necessarily address life-threatening issues, but it's actually okay to get them done. Did you know that a cosmetic surgery that is re relatively common and has even been done to underage people is breast reduction surgery. Sometimes the titties are just too big. Sometimes that can even happen to people when they're not even 18 yet. It's not super common, but it has happened. And it is entirely possible for uh, uh, you know young girls to get breast reduction surgery. That is a healthy body of a young person that is being cut into, but we accept this. Because medicine often requires we cut into people's bodies. If a mentally ill man who identifies as an amputee... <laughs> why, why not go further? Hold up a picture of an Apache helicopter, okay? Hold up, hold up a picture of a helicopter. Please, why not? Why, why, why stop here? For, uh, fr frankly, I'm just insulted by the, uh, the cowardice here. Go full tilt and... Show a picture of a helicopter. Asks a doctor to amputate his perfectly functioning arm to match his identity. Every self-respecting surgeon will send him away. So the reason for this is because uh, we have absolutely no body of medical evidence to suggest that it improves people's lives to cut off their arms when they ask us to. But we do have an overwhelming body of evidence to suggest that there are a variety of gender-affirming medical procedures that we can do that do improve people's lives. We've been doing them for decades, and they have an astonishingly low regret rate. This is the currently being retooled ultimate research document. I made it a long time ago, and I'm remaking it now, starting with trans people, because they're so important. If we take a moment to read. Regret and detransition are incredibly rare. Okay, so... Let's think about this for a second. If the claims are that uh, gender-affirming care harms people, we would have to see that reflected in the data. And yet, a meta-analysis of 27 studies on patient regret rates following gender-affirming surgery found that of nearly 8,000 patients surveyed, only about 1% reported regret. This is another study with a expressed regret rate of about 0.2 to 0.3 percent. This study found a reported regret rate of about 0.3 percent. That's not a lot of regret, especially when you compare it to this. 
an enormous meta-analysis on 889 studies concerning regret in surgical decision-making. So this is all surgical decision-making. Not trans stuff, everything. Found that on average, in procedures ranging from trivial to life-saving, the average rate of self-reported decision regret was 1 in 7, about 14%. The average rate of surgical regret is about 14%. Trans surgical regret, 1% or less. The regret rates following trans uh, gender affirming surgery are astonishingly low. They're actually anomalously low. They're psychotically low. It, it, it's, it's actually like, it's, it's, it's mathematically ridiculous that they're this low. I guess they really want it. I guess, I guess that people aren't just hopping onto gender affirming surgery, which is very expensive and time consuming. And it places you in a category of people who are massively discriminated against. I guess they're not just doing this on a whim, if you can imagine such a thing. The, 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 the distinction here in reported regret rate is insane. And what that means, of course, is that if PragerU is making the argument that this regret rate, this rate of harm, is too high, we could simply not do any surgery. You all understand this? Keep in mind that the regret rate that we saw in surgeries broadly, included people undergoing life-saving surgeries. So we just can't do anything that, I guess. <laughs> uh, well. If a young girl suffering from anorexia walks into a hospital and asks for liposuction, no one in their right mind would grant her request. This is, of course, because unlike gender-affirming surgeries, we don't have a body of medical evidence to suggest massively improved quality of life after performing liposuction on anorexic people. See, this is why when we make decisions about what kind of medical procedures to engage in, we use things called evidence. We gather this evidence from research conducted by researchers on the behavior of doctors. And that is how we make these decisions. That's actually how we make basically all medical decisions. It's called standard of care. Doctors have to read big books on the subject <laughs> before they can get their uh, doctorate. By the way, guys, for those of you who have seen me do the song and dance before, I apologize if I sound repetitive compared to, um, you know, the content we've done before. I, I want to make sure every time I go over something like this, I'm being comprehensive. So, you know, there's always somebody new watching. And that's because physicians swear an oath to do no harm, to preserve and protect and heal a person's body as best as they can, in spite of any delusions the person may be experiencing. Uh, nothing about the Hippocratic Oath involves a caveat for delusions. Uh, that seems kind of like a weird and hyper-specific addendum right there. But yes, uh, the idea is they follow the uh, best standard of practice to try to help people stay as healthy and happy as possible, which they're doing here. So cool. Nice. And yet doctors violate that oath every time they promote gender affirming care. They do not. <laughs> you have not even in this video, have you failed? Not even in this video um, have they managed to demonstrate this. You, you have failed even in your wildly dishonest propaganda piece that um, lies about basically every subject presented and props up uh, and apologizes for terrorism, you've still not managed to sufficiently demonstrate this claim. Their motives, no matter how compassionate they might sound, are not relevant. That's, that's true. As long as they're following the standard of care, I don't really care about the motives of the individual doctors. If they're doing the stuff that leads to the best outcomes, yeah, sure. The idea that teenagers, let alone small children, are capable of making such life-altering decisions. What life-altering decisions? They've been very strategically ambiguous about what gender-affirming care means, right? Because they, the way they want you to go about it is they want you to think they mean surgery every time they say gender-affirming care. They keep analogizing it to cutting into your body. So, to, so they, they've drawn an association. Gender-affirming care means surgery. But then we took a look at the, uh, the one... Daily Wire article, or not Daily Wire, sorry, the um, Daily Mail article 
on the the Yale uh, 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 doctor who bragged about you know um, providing gender care to a three year old, and it turns out they don't allow for surgery until eighteen. You know, but in that case, gender care meant consult. Is not only brand new, it's absurd. A society that it's not brand new, uh, actually. Not only do we have decades and decades of research and precedent on trans people here in the West, we also have anthropological evidence concerning uh, social transition, you know? Uh, for example, there's like the third gender in India. We have like research on Polynesian cultures, various Native American cultures. Uh, the further back you go in history, the more wacky and warbly and less comprehensive a lot of gender norms seem to be. Uh, but what they find is that a lot of the stuff that people did back then, rather casually, might have been analogized today to a kind of gender-affirming care in a consultation sense, you know? Maybe a social role that people are comfortable fitting in. And obviously, you know, go back that far and the idea of like healthcare as a concept doesn't even exist really, so we're not talking exactly apples to apples, but we certainly have our evidence. That allows them to do so is deeply broken. So, how do we put an end to this horror? Oh, well, you could do what the um, Nazis did. Uh, the Nazis held massive book burnings. Some of the first things they chose to burn in their book burnings were the, uh, the, the collected archives of research on transgender people. Here, let me see if I can get a nice, uh, the forgotten history of the world's first trans clinic. See, much like the modern day Republican Party, Nazis really didn't like trans people that much. Here are some trans people looking, if I might say, pretty, pretty good? Kind of mogging us, to be honest. What are you guys wearing right now? Sweatpants? You think you would you think you would win in a vogue off against a Weimar Germany transgender? Probably not. The Institut für Sexual Wissenschaft was an early private sexology research institute in Germany from 1919 to 1933. Does anybody want to take a guess at what happened in 1933 that made this clinic no longer open? Right. Yeah. The Institute pioneered research and treatment for various matters regarding gender and sexuality, including gay, trans, and intersex topics. In addition, it offered various other services to the general public, including treatments for alcoholism, gynecological examinations, marital and sex counseling, treatment for venereal diseases, and access to uh, uh, sorry, contraceptive treatment. It offered education on many of these matters to both health professionals and laypersons. It was a, a cultural touchstone. It was a wellspring of knowledge that helped many people. And then, after the Nazis gained control, the Institute and its libraries were destroyed as part of a Nazi government censorship program by youth brigades who burned its books and documents in the street. Make no mistake, Republicans are looking to do the exact same thing right now. In an age of uh, internet access to information, book burnings aren't really effective at getting rid of information, but they're trying to achieve the same long-term political goal, which is the absolute outlawing of not only anything pertaining to trans care, but also education relating to it, to bring us back into a dark age for no reason. First, we need to stop going along with the language games gender ideologues want us to play. There are men and women and boys and girls. And there are men and women and boys and girls who are confused or deluded about which one they are. There is... Again, there's not really a point in engaging with this because uh, conservative rhetoric in the subject requires them to pretend that sex and gender are the same thing. We've addressed this literally like a million times. Sex refers to biology, gender refers to social role, blah, 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 we've done this. Conservatives agree with this. I have talked to many conservatives on this subject. Ben Shapiro himself has multiple times, after being directly challenged, acknowledged the difference between the two. That's not a joke. He has directly said that. People have said, okay, well, can you acknowledge there are two different concepts here and we're referring to one, not the other? And Ben will say, okay. And then he just goes about in that conversation with the two concepts. And then the next day, it, he, they go back to pretending that there's only one. So, you know, there's not really a point in engaging. 
is no such thing as having a place on a gender spectrum. With the rarest exceptions, we are born one of two sexes. Not that rare. Uh, intersex people are around 1% of the population. Also, gender is an abstract, incoherent, and let's face it, very gay construct. Sex actually is a, um, a, a, a bimodal distribution with a spectrum to it. After all, the characteristics that we associate with sex are not actually chromosomes, but the things that chromosomes direct hormones to do to us. Chromosomes don't make our bodies the way they are. Hormone washes in the womb and during puberty do. So if you could somehow have a set of chromosomes and then get a different set of hormone washes, you might end up being a different sex despite your chromosomes. This is what happens to people who are born XY but have androgen insensitivity. Let's take a look at that super quick. When a person who is genetically male, who has one X and one Y chromosome, is resistant to male hormones, or androgens. Many people who have androgen insensitivity syndrome live their entire lives as women because they're insensitive to androgen. Like, you wouldn't know, often. And there are intersex people for whom you might sometimes definitely know. Um, there is an incredible amount of variety in how humans can develop. Can you explain the science again? I'm kind of confused. Okay, to put it very simply, when we are fetuses, uh, when or zygotes or whatever, when we're still being made, um, our body parts are analogous and sex undifferentiated. Basically, our body is clay, and our body needs instruction on how it wants to shape itself. And the instruction that it receives will dictate whether you end up being of the male or female sex. And basically, you've probably all heard this before, but the genitalia of males and females are biologically analogous. That is to say, you started with some origin point of your body, and then because you received certain signals, that initial clay shaped itself into either a vagina, ovary, womb, blah, blah, or uh, into a penis, gonad, so on and so forth. Uh, but they're the same, it's the same origin point. So the thing that directs your body to shape itself one way or the other, it's determined by the hormone washes that you receive, you know, broadly estrogen and testosterone, though I'm simplifying a little bit. And uh, the hormones that you, you know, that, that flow through your body, that'll, that'll direct the process. You know, this is why puberty leads to so many like increases in not only your size, but in the development of primary and secondary sex characteristics, because puberty floods you with hormones, right? That's why teenagers are such moody bitches. They're literally like their their body is partially developed clay and you hit puberty and you you receive the signal and your your you know the, the hormone flood that runs through your body directs further growth, uh you know, literally in this case. Um you all understand what I'm getting at here? The point that I'm trying to make clear is this is a remarkably ambiguous process. Some people are way more packed full of estrogen or testosterone than others. There are two people you can imagine who are both biologically female, but in every characteristic that we associate with the female sex, one is more so than the other. We could do the same for two males, couldn't we? That one male could be taller, stronger, hairier, have more developed... Uh, genitalia, higher sperm count, whatever. In these respects, I think you could fairly argue that person is, at least in a biological sense, literally more of a man uh, than the others because they have an excessive development of these characteristics. Socially, we don't always think of it that way because socially, socially, when we talk about what it means to be a man or a woman, we're not doing a pH dipstick in a person's ear to determine the exact proportion of hormone washes they received. In reality, we're talking about a broad social category they fit in. We use these terms for social purposes. We use them for social categories. And the purpose of those social categories is to define meaning. It's to give purpose. It's to assist in understanding. And, and none of you know what your f***ing biology is. You don't know. I'd be willing to bet a lot of you don't even know for sure which chromosomes you have. You can guess, but there are a lot of intersex people. You don't know what your proportional homo hormone washes are. You don't know if you have any conditions that pertain to sensitivity or insensitivity for any given set of hormones. There are a million things that can go wrong. It doesn't make you wrong, but 
differently in the process. This is why uh, I believe the American Scientific... Just a moment. Yes, the Scientific American, um, which you probably heard of before, it's um, a prominent and well-respected publication, has talked before about how biological sex is a spectrum, where they talk about how, given the incredible complexity in characteristics we associate with biological sex, you know, there are, there are so many ways things can pan out. Conservatives are afraid of complexity because conservatives are retarded. Their small brains, smooth and soup-like, can't hold on to facts the way ours can, and for that reason they, they, they grasp ineptly at these concepts. But that doesn't make them any less true. Let's finish this up. Male or female? That's the level of complexity they're capable of, right there. That, that, is, the, uh, that is what they've got. Born one of two sexes, male or female. Sex is not assigned. It is an integral part of who we are right from the moment of conception. So as, um, as we just discussed with, with how, um, with how this actually works with, um, so, so yeah, wrong, of course, but okay. This is true for horses, dolphins, and every other species in the animal kingdom. Uh, okay. So not only is all of the genetic variability that I've talked about in humans present in other animals, some animals have far greater levels of sex-based variants to the point where there are literally animals that will change sex. Like, uh, it, I, I, I'm pretty sure that um, like the sex of a crocodile um, is influenced by the average temperature of the water that their egg is in. Um, which means that it's not from the moment of their conception. In crocodilians, the temperature of egg incubation uh, is the environmental factor determining sex. If the temperature is cool around 30 degrees Celsius, the hatchlings are all female. Warmer temperatures around 34 degrees Celsius hatch all males. Yes, clownfish are all hermaphroditic. They literally change sex over their lifetimes. When the female dies, the dominant male changes sex and becomes the female. Oh, wow. It's like a boy failure for uh, Twitter transes. This life history strategy is known as sequential hermaphrodism. Because clownfish are all born as males, they are protandrous hermaphrodites. Oof. For another interesting example, it has been known that lionesses have grown manes, a male characteristic for lions, in the absence of males to lead their pack. Though rumored for quite some time, scientists have officially reported the existence of maned female lions and have documented their more typically male behavior. This is because they literally observe in their environment a deficiency in uh, male lion behavior, and they just do it themselves. So, hey, human trans people, what's wrong with you? Lions are literally capable of willing themselves trans. You have to take hormones. Don't you? You have to inject estrogen uh, into your into your ass cheek. The 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 lioness simply concentrates until she becomes a lion. Yeah, trans mask king, literally. So yeah, the the idea that human sex is as simple as male and female is dumb. The idea that all animals in the animal kingdom are like that is incomprehensibly stupid, willfully so. They know they're lying. It is also true for human beings. There is no such thing as gender affirming care. You that yeah, is, you can Google it. It's a thing. But it cannot affirm something that does not exist. What was that? Wait, hold on. First of all, gender affirming care is a term that refers to medical care. The medical care exists. You've spent the whole video complaining about it. That doesn't make any sense. You're so dumb. Um, second of all, listen to how she says this. As gender affirming care. You cannot affirm something. Cannot. It's just cannot. Uh. She has that like soccer mom upper bite. Something that does not exist. What does exist is chemical castration, sterilization, and surgical mutilation. I interestingly, I noticed that at no point in this video have they actually talked about uh anything. They haven't talked about any trans surgery. They haven't talked about its rate of regret. They haven't talked about detransition. They haven't talked about what it physically entails. 
Don't get me wrong, guys. Bottom surgery, top surgery, they're trying procedures. Look into them. They're tough to do. I feel like, if anything, we could have gotten more... Did you know that for bottom surgery, they twist the penis inside out and then cut it up a bunch and then flip it and do a little doodad and then they do a pretzel knot? And like, I'm, I'm surprised we're not getting more grotesque, meaningless, surgical gore porn here. It's really dumb. Second, we need legal accountability. Patients who have undergone physical and medical gender treatments as minors should be able to sue the doctors and hospitals who performed the treatments. So you know for a fact that this would never actually happen because this would be like an anti-corporate profit move and the insurance companies wouldn't like it either. Um, the Republicans aren't going to do anything that makes insurance companies ha uh, unhappy. But uh, additionally, uh, no, we actually, actually, it is, not, uh, it is not a good thing if you can just sue a doctor for any reason. Yeah, I, I really do like the bow and the chin here. They're really trying to do like the trans woman gross out thing, but on like a 14 year old. It reminds me of, um, it reminds me of the kid that Sai Thomas saves at the beginning of One Punch Man, you know? <laughs> the risk of serious financial liability will bring this barbarism to an end. Liability for what? They have a lower regret rate than like any other medical procedure. <laughs> regret rate for what? Uh, okay. What regret? Faster than a hundred protests. This is a battle that we must win. Not least because there is an entire generation of boys and girls being made to believe that irreversibly changing their bodies will fix the social and emotional anxieties they experience. Oh, well, it would be really inconvenient if there was data to suggest that it actually did help. You know, that'd be really unfortunate. I haven't updated that part of the doc yet. I haven't finished that part. Did my mic gate make that all go away? I tried to do a whisper. I, I, I was trying to do a whisper, so it was like a joke. I'm not going to say it normally. I'm actually just going to go in my settings, and I'm going to remove the noise gate. Okay. I haven't actually updated that part of the doc yet. I haven't done that part yet. We have to wait for that part. Now now I'm going to add the noise suppression back in. Okay. Nicely done, team. Well done. Oh, but, but, but the data we have does in fact indicate that trans people are happy after their um, medical care. Uh, so I think that... Um, we know for a fact that we have very high rates of satisfaction with gender affirming surgery because of the incredibly low regret rate. What I'm interested in is research pertaining to reported increases in happiness after gender affirming care, including just hormones. I do have some like that. This is a portion of the old document. I can't really vouch for, oh wait, yes I can. I'm so sorry, my apologies. Because it opens up with this meta-analysis on trans people and the effect gender transition has on their mental health. Of 56 studies, 52 indicated transitioning had a positive effect on the mental health of trans people. The remaining four? Mixed or no results. Not a single study said that transgender medical care resulted in a negative effect. Zero. None. I'm glad I looked anyway. I just haven't updated this part of the document yet. Somebody linked this earlier from Matt Walsh, the guy who prompted the bomb threat. The claim that gender transition prevents suicide is not only false according to all of the available data, source, but also deeply grotesque and morally repugnant. Oh, well, can I get that data? Whoa, wait, 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 hold on. Can I get that data? Please? Not only does it defy, defy common sense, but I, I, find it, I find it frankly grotesque that the way to, to stop facts don't care about your feelings a child from tragically hurting themselves is to affirm their belief that there's something wrong with their body, that they were born in the wrong body, that they're the wrong person. No, I, the way to help anyone. They're the wrong person? But are we, are we getting it like epistemic identity arguments here? Um, we have data that just regular cosmetic surgeries can reduce suicide rates. Uh, burn victims or people who have 
let's be fair here, severe and grotesque physical abnormalities have often reported significant increases in happiness and quality of life after cosmetic surgery to remove it. So, okay, so what, is it wrong to say they were born in the wrong body? Well, it's not really about them being born in the wrong body. It's just, what are they now? How do they feel now? And how can medicine improve how they feel? And, you know, that can take a number of forms. In this case, gender-affirming care. Anyone who's in despair in that way, especially a child, is to, is to help them towards actual self-acceptance, who you really are. So if you're a biological man... So this is what many researchers tried to do with homosexuals as well, and still continue to with conversion camps. Uh, they are considered torture by many more civilized countries than ours. These parents will beat their children and then send them to conversion camps where predatory uh, religious fundamentalists will molest them, tase them, starve them to try to de-gay them. Because to them, of course, being gay, it's not a thing you can be. It's just a kind of degenerate perversion that is, uh, you know, can be taught out of somebody. Obviously, conversion therapy doesn't fix anything. It unfixes a lot of things. And uh, the same is the case with trans people. What he's advocating here uh, for here are, are trans conversion camps. Male and you're a boy and you're 15 years old and you feel like you're a girl. The message should be, uh, no, you're a boy and that's a wonderful thing to be who you are. And, and we will help you to- Yes, trans women have never heard that from the people in their family. That's, that would have stopped them in their tracks. No trans girl has ever heard their parents say, no, you're a boy, without immediately dropping the issue. To accept that because it's wonderful to be who you are. This is who you are. That should be our message. Instead, the message they get from the medical community is, well, oh, okay, if you, if you feel like you were born in the wrong body, then you were, and we'll start chopping pieces of you off. Always, always with the alarmist language referring to surgery, you know? Always, always, always. Until the bad thoughts go away. And I just find that to be utterly horrific and, uh, and insane on its face. Well, horrific it may be, the data suggests that the trans people end up pretty happy with the results. I wish I could see any of this so-called all of the available data on the relationship between gender transition and suicide rates. I would love to see that. I know I'm not going to. Good point, Quoteth. We'll look at that in a second. Let's finish this properly. We must act now. Our children are counting on us, even if they don't know it. They are, after all, just children. I'm Kaylee McGee White of the Washington Examiner and Independent Women's Forum for Prager University. Yeah, they're just children, which is why it's critical uh, we take their medical concerns seriously and act in accordance with the best possible standard of care, something we know quite a lot about at this point. Um, can't you get a debate with anyone from the Daily Wire? The Daily Wire people will never debate me because they are pussies and I am smarter and cooler than all of them put together. After that conversation with Charlie Kirk, where he came in there spitting fire and I then essentially within five minutes, uh, introduced him to a two and a half hour lecture on history and race politics, where he was literally asking me my opinion on things. Charlie Kirk, you know, fascist, you know, Gestapo wannabe, asking me to educate him. You think any of these people would dare? Absolutely not. Of them, the one who would fare best is without a doubt, uh, Ben, Ben Shapiro. Um, but this is still a losing subject for all of them. I've said before, there's a time from the fascist's perspective, for consolidation and expansion. And the expansion period of time is when they pretend that they're engaged in civil discourse. Expansion is when they, 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 they insist that they want to have their ideas criticized. They want to engage with others and have the flaws in their perspective addressed and rebutted. And the consolidation is when they stop doing debates because they know they're full of shit and they know that their ridiculous rhetoric could be easily corrected. So they keep it close to chest, they stay on their platforms, and they scream uh, monstrosities. And, and, and I think we're very much in that time period. But, you know, we'll, we'll see what we can do. We'll see. Oh, um, this is from Aaron Reed on Twitter. I think this is a good way to end off the bill. While it is true that conservatives are monsters, not permanently, you can change, but for now, the attitudes towards trans people might not be as virulent as you think. 
Republicans have doubled, tripled, quadrupled down on trans culture war talking points being the thing they're going to run on. So how do their voters feel? A new poll out of Kentucky, not a Democrat stronghold here, shows that 71% of people in Kentucky oppose laws that ban gender-affirming care. Wow. 71% of people in Kentucky oppose laws that ban gender-affirming care, the main thing Republicans are trying to push on a statewide level right now. Even 62% of Republicans oppose those laws. In Kentucky, nearly two-thirds of the Republicans there oppose those laws. After Republicans' poor performance in the 2022 midterms, I think, you know, it might bear asking, how do you think the average Republican, who is, by the way, struggling right now with inflation, with low wages, with a variety of things, how are they feeling when they go and they take a look at any of their preferred conservative news sites, uh, articles, YouTubers, politicians, and all they hear about is trans, 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 trans. This hyper-fixated culture war attitude might actually end up biting the GOP a bit. You know, it might actually get them back a little. That being said, keep in mind that Republicans historically are a lot more progressive on single-issue polling than they are when it comes to the candidates they vote for. Florida, after all, voted to raise the minimum wage and re-enfranchise felons. And then they voted for Ron DeSantis.